heard of the story of the Good Samaritan. I think most of us at least have heard the phrase being a Good Samaritan. Um, and many of us, of course, have read the Bible where we have read the story. So now we're going to make the story come alive for you because uh, where we are, uh, this mosaic that you see is original from the 4th century A.D., from the time Queen Helena built the church on this site. So this is the original floor of that 4th century church. But it was built, this church was, on an existing church, which was built on a, uh, well, not a church, but a gathering point, which was built on the original inn. There was actually an inn. We can, Ezra's going to show us some of the foundations of the inn, that was here. So Jesus didn't make it up that there was an inn uh, along the way where, you know, the Good Samaritan dropped the guy off, and there really was an inn here. And so when Queen Helena comes through, she says, where did this happen? It was easy to show her because they still had, you know, the foundations of the inn, and she built this church. And um, so uh, this story, of course, figures prominently uh, in uh, a major part, a major incident in the New Testament. So I want us to, to, uh, to take a look at that. We're in Luke chapter 10, for those of you who want to follow along in your Bible. <laughs> and actually, the story of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the Good Samaritan, was part of a larger context. Uh, I will say it now, a text without a context is a pretext. Now what that means is a, a text, you know, a verse, or the Bible, or a story, without a context of how it was situated in the Bible and what was happening before it and after it, if you just pull it out and just make it stand on its own with no context around it, it's a pretext. So people do that. You know, they take a verse or maybe even a couple of verses, pull them out of the Bible, flop them up on the wall like a piece of wet spaghetti, and they go, all right, what do you think it means? Uh, I don't know. What do you think it means? Uh, I don't What do you think it means? Well, that's not how you interpret the Bible. I mean, things are in context. And so it's only when we study the Bible expositionally and we're moving through a passage on a, on a systematic way that we get the context before and after the passage, which helps us understand what the passage is really talking about. The Good Samaritan story is not told primarily to instruct us to be nice to our neighbor. Now, if you just pull the, the, the Good Samaritan out of the Bible, it's a story, and put it up on the wall like a piece of spaghetti, one would conclude that the purpose of the parable is to tell us to everybody be nice to everybody and help everybody out. That is not what the story is really all about. I mean, we should be nice to people. No, I'm okay with that, you know. But that's not what the story is about. The story is in context. And when we read the context, we find out that the story was meant to teach something very different. Let's read it. Uh, let's look at it. All right? Here we go. On one occasion, an expert in the law, the, uh, some versions will say a lawyer, but this is not a, 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 like a lawyer lawyer. You know, it's not an adjudicator. It's not a litigator. This was a person who was an expert in the Old Testament law. So this guy knew the law, stood to test Jesus, and said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, that's what started it. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a good question. Every human being alive ought to be asking that question. I was talking to someone the other day who was uh, witnessing to, uh, to a Jewish friend and said to the Jewish friend, what's going to happen to you after you die? And, uh, and I, I had told, I said beforehand at church that Jewish rabbis don't deal with this. They just say, well, we don't worry about that. We, you know, we, we live for this life. It's Gentiles who worry about the afterlife. You know, Christians do that. I'm like, what fool would accept that kind of answer to a question like that? You've got to be out of your mind if you ask the question, what's going to happen to me after I die and survive? 
mind says, well, we don't worry about that. And you go, oh, okay, what kind of idiot would you, are you? Then, okay, fine, we don't worry about that. Are you stupid? What's wrong with you? Of course we worry about that. And uh, this is a good question to ask. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Good for him. He's off to a good start. What is written in the law, Jesus said? How do you read it? Well, now you understand. This makes sense. The guy's supposed to be an expert in the law. That's what he does for a profession. Jesus said, all right, you're so smart. You know the law so well. How do you read the Bible? And they, the lawyer answered, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. These both come out of the Old Testament, right? Yeah. One out of the book of Deuteronomy, one out of the book of Leviticus. And Jesus said, you have answered correctly. Bingo. You get the gold star. Bingo. Do this, and you'll have eternal life. Okay, bingo. The guy got it right. Now there's only one problem, though, isn't there? Nobody can do this perfectly. And remember what the book of James says. He who keeps the law in every regard and yet breaks it in one area is still be breaking the whole law. This is an all or nothing deal. You know, this is not 90% still gives you an A. You know, you know what I'm saying. You've got to either do it 100% or zero. Those are your, your options. Everybody with me? So who can do this? Who can love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength every moment of every day of your entire life? Well, I can't. Can you? No. And even if the lawyer said, well, I can do that because, I mean, really, how would you prove that wrong? Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I can definitely prove that every one of us here doesn't do that. I watched you on the tour. <laughs> We're all human. We all do selfish stuff, right? We all put ourselves first from time to time, right? You know, the last green puff, you grab it before the guy behind you. That's loving your neighbor as yourself, right there. You know, because he wanted the green puff, or whatever those things are called. All right, my point is, Nobody can do this. Nobody. He got the answer right, but it's impossible. All right, so what should his response have been? Well, a humble response would have been, gee, Lord, if that's what I got to do, I can't do that. If this is plan A for getting into heaven, I got to have plan B. Because I can't, I can't, I, I, I'm not capable of doing it. That would have been a humble, honest response, right? And the beauty is that the Lord Jesus has provided plan B. I'm reading from Romans uh, 3, <coughs> excuse me, 321. It says, um, uh, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's plan B. Plan B is there's a way to be righteous in the sight of God apart from the law, apart from human effort, apart from loving your neighbor as yourself and loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it's through the blood of Christ shed on the cross. That's plan B. Okay, and Jesus would have told him about plan B if the guy would have humbled himself and said, I can't do plan A. But that's not what he did. Look, but wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Well, I've got to love my neighbor as myself. I want to work my way into heaven. So where do we draw the line between who my neighbor is and who my neighbor isn't? Instead of lowering himself in humility, what did he try to do? Instead, he tried to lower God's standard. Do you understand? There's only two choices when it comes to people in our world. We either lower ourselves and humble ourselves before God and, and, and accept Christ, or we seek to lower God's standard so we can keep it, which is what most people try to do. That's what he tried to do. Where can I draw the line? If we're only talking about my best friends, we're only talking about maybe my family, we're only talking about my bosom buddies, maybe I can do this. You see what he's saying? 
He's just, you know, he's trying to figure out, all right, how many people have to do this for? Not humbling himself. He's trying to humble God's standard. And then comes the parable of the Good Samaritan. So the parable of the Good Samaritan is not about being nice to people. It's about the def definition of who our neighbor is in order to satisfy working our way into heaven. Everybody understand? Okay. And the goal of the Good Samaritan parable was to flush this guy out and make this guy admit he couldn't do it. Everybody with me? And then he needed another plan to get to heaven. That, in context, is what this is all about. Okay, so let's read it. Who's my neighbor, the guy says. Where do I draw the lines? Okay, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. That makes sense now, right? Yeah. Okay, that wasn't just an expression. Okay, that's an accurate description of the topology of what we are. Okay, and, and when he fell into the hands of robbers, and that really happened in the days of Jesus, highwaymen, uh, banditos, uh, lived all along this road and they hid around the curves they ambushed people and they stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went away leaving him half dead and a priest happened to be going down the same road not a Catholic priest a Jewish priest you know like one of the holy holy muckamucks of Israel you understand what I'm saying one of the guys that you would think if anybody would have uh, a, a biblical perspective on kindness to other people he would have. And he was going down the road, he saw the man and passed by on the other side of the road. So he crossed the road and went around the guy. Beautiful. So to a Levite, Levites, you know, were also holy men that worked in the temple. When he came to the place, he saw the man and passed on the other side of the road. Wonderful people. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. Now, we told you earlier the Samaritans were half-breeds, the result of the Assyrians importing people into the northern kingdom when they conquered it, 721 BC, intermarrying with Jewish people who were still left there, and forming a group of half-breeds called Samaritans. You know how the Jews felt about the Samaritans, right? Remember we said Jesus wouldn't even, or no Jew, would travel through the Samaritan country, they would go around it to come to Jerusalem. And remember what the woman at the well said, John chapter 4. She said, what are you doing, a Jew, talking to me, a Samaritan? Do you, don't, do you, do you don't talk to us? You people hate us. So I love the fact there's humor here. <laughs> there's humor here that Jesus picked for the hero, a Samaritan, that every single Jewish person, and certainly this warrior, hated. Oh. <laughs> that's funny. You don't think that's funny? It's early. Okay. Well, it is fun. But a Samaritan, <laughs> as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He poured oil and wine on, oil to soothe the wound, wine to disinfect it, okay? And, and then, after he did that, he put the man on his own donkey, took him to the inn, right where we are, right? And, and took care of him overnight. The next day, he took out two silver coins, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, look after him, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Then Jesus turns to the lawyer and says, Now, which of these three, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? We're trying to define who a neighbor is. Who do you think was a neighbor? And the expert in the law said, well, it was the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do the same. What's the point of the parable? The guy asked, who is my neighbor? Jesus' answer is, who isn't your neighbor? That's the answer to the question. Well, with that definition of neighbor, 
Nobody can keep this. Yes? Every single person we pass, we have to treat them like we would ourselves. Can't be done. Now, as far as we know, the lawyer still didn't humble himself. You would think after that, he would have said, well, Lord, if that's the definition of a neighbor, I'm cooked. I mean, I'm in big trouble. I can't do that. Is there any other way to get into heaven? But as far as we know, he, be a lawyer. he might have. Don't be a lawyer. <laughs> but the Bible stops at that point. Okay, so now you understand what the Good Samaritan parable was really all about. Not about being nice to people but about defining what a neighbor is so that we can define who we have to treat like ourselves if we're trying to work our way into heaven, which means nobody can do it. We all together? All right, that's what the parable is really about. However, it's still got a great point that we need, to, we need to, to try to be good Samaritans to other people. And I don't know about you, but... My greatest enemy in being a good Samaritan uh, is not the desire to want to want to be a good Samaritan. It's the crazy schedule I keep. You know, I, I'm in such a hurry all the time with so much to do, just trying to keep up. You know, when you're a preacher, the problem is Sunday always comes. Doesn't matter what else is going on, Sunday always comes. And you, you can't get up on Sunday morning and say, well, gosh, I went around all week treating people nice and helping people and being a good Samaritan. So I don't have anything to say, but I was a good Samaritan this week. Well, you, you get away with that probably two weeks in a row before somebody gets going to get the chance to be a good Samaritan to you. <laughs> but you're not going to have a job. You understand what I'm saying? People are going to say, God bless you. Go be a good Samaritan on your own dime. We're firing you. You, you, we have other preachers here. You know what I'm talking about. Sunday always comes. You better be ready for Sunday. And, I, you know, I'm about one week ahead of, of my, that's all I am, <laughs> one week ahead of my congregation. I hit the ground Monday morning running, and I don't stop running till the weekend, and then I hit the ground on Monday morning running. I mean, I don't have a lot of extra time. Uh, Ken Daniel, my good friend, is always asking me, have you read this book? 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 <laughs> And I'm like, when, when do you think I get time just to sit around and at my leisure read all these books you're talking about? I don't have that kind of time. Are you kidding? Are you serious? So my I elite, mean, I think some of you run at the same schedule, don't you? Listen, that's the greatest enemy of being a good Samaritan is we're all in such a hurry. Because to be a good Samaritan, you gotta slow down. You gotta it's the inconvenience. You gotta be willing to interrupt your schedule. You gotta be willing to take time you weren't planning to take when you woke up that morning to help somebody. And I'm not good at that. You know, I'm I just I'm like on the rails and chugging full steam and anything off the rails, I am not good at stopping. And maybe you're the same way. Folks, if we're gonna be good Samaritans though. We've got to have a mindset that says, you know what? I mean, there's a, there, we, you know, there's, we have to be reasonable. But within reason, people, we got to slow down for people. We just got to slow down and take time to help people if we get the chance to do that. You know, uh, I, a few years ago, I was uh, coming home from church and my, uh, uh, on a Sunday evening, and we had taken my son Justin to Iwana. And we were coming home, and um, I was on in a hurry to get home because I had to go the next night down to the Central Union Mission down in Washington, D.C. And where I was going to speak to the supporters, I had like a banquet, you know what I'm saying? And I was going to talk to them about how important it is to take care of people who are down and out. So, so I had to go home and work on this message for the next night. So we stopped at 7-Eleven, just near our house as we were headed home. And sitting outside of 7-Eleven on, on the ground was this guy. And he said to me, he said, do you, do you have any money that you can give me for a pack of cigarettes? And I said, no. I went on in, Justin, I got what we want. I came back out. He said, hey, have you got any money you can give me for a pack of cigarettes? And I said, no. Jumped in the car, got started the car, got ready to drive away. And then I thought, you hypocrite. <coughs> Here you got a guy who's down and out 
and you don't have time to help him because you're in a hurry to go home and do a message about how we need to take care of each other. <laughs> <laughs> There's something wrong with this picture of mine. So I said, yeah, Lord, you're right. So I stopped the car, got out of the car, went inside. If this offends you, I'm sorry. Bought him a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> Brought the cigarettes out, gave it to him, and I said, what's your name? And he said, Jimmy. I said, Jimmy, where do you live? He said, oh, my God, kind of a little room not far from here. He said, but I, I don't have any transportation, and I hurt my leg, and so I'm, I said, all right, come on, get in the car. Mm -hmm. So we took him to his house. Oh, my gosh. Unbelievable. Dishes in the sink, food. I don't know how long since he's cleaned up. Rotten food. <coughs> just a mess. It was just a mess. Anyway, I said, come on, Justin, we're going to wash this man's dishes. Justin was about nine. <laughs> <laughs> you serious? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to wash man's dishes. I, you know, and so I wash dishes, you know, ask Brenda. So we washed his dishes and cleaned up all the dirty food, got the guy in bed. I called a friend of mine who uh, was in AA, because this guy was an alcoholic, bought wine, bottles, beer bottles everywhere. Called a friend of mine in AA right from his house and said, hey, Ricky, you got to come over and help this guy. So he drives over. And they got him into AA. And uh, I don't know how the story ends. I lost touch with Jimmy uh, over the years. But it, that's not the point. The point is, this is the kind of people the Lord wants us to be. You know? Uh, we see somebody begging for money on the street with no legs. You know, give us some money. I mean, they probably drive a Mercedes, but who they still don't. I mean, I know there are stories like that, you know, where the where they're they're con artists. But I'd rather take the risk of giving them the money and assuming they really need it than not giving them anything. Stop and give them some money, but we're in a hurry, right? So we don't stop. We don't, you know, if somebody needs help. Uh, or you see someone trying to get a disabled person out of a van, you know, in a disabled parking spot. It's one person, maybe a woman, struggling to get a child out of Oh, we're here to help her. But we're in a hurry. Right? And that's the greatest enemy, at least for me, of being a good Samaritan. We have a core value at the Play Bible Church that says people matter to God and they matter to us. It's our number one core value. I wish I lived it much as I should. But that's what it's all about. If we're going to be good Samaritans, we have to go out of our house every day saying, you are entering good Samaritan territory. Now slow down a little bit and have some time for people today that might need some help. I need to hear that. I hope you do too. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the truth of this story in context. Reminding us that no one can work their way into heaven. And in your marvelous mercy and grace, you provided plan B through the death of Christ on the cross. We are so grateful, Lord. Help us to humble ourselves and to grab plan B in humility and in repentance. And admit that we're helpless to work our way into heaven. But Lord, even on a broader basis, help us to take to heart what the Good Samaritan did. He certainly had an agenda that day, and it didn't include stopping and helping this man on the road, but he did. And so, Lord, help us not to be in so much of a hurry to get our to-do list done that we don't have a moment to stop and help people and have compassion for people that are all around us. Forgive us for being in such a hurry that we simply just can't be Good Samaritans busy. So speak to our hearts and change the way we react and live in the everyday world that we are in. And we pray this in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Amen. And I'll tell you one funny story about this is coming. They were building this about...
water.
will not touch you. Uh, there's a great lesson here. There are many great lessons here, honestly. One of them is the timing of God. David was content to become king when God decided he would become king and not to take matters in his own hands and in the energy of the flesh move the timetable around. But that's another message. We're not going to talk about that today. What we want to talk about is there was an opportunity here for David that he didn't take. That is, to kill Saul. Now what's interesting <clears throat> is that several years before, he had had an opportunity to kill Goliath, and he took that opportunity. So, how do you know when do you take an opportunity, and when do you not take an opportunity? Uh, the very, very famous British uh, Prime Minister, Disraeli, Benjamin Disraeli, said, next to knowing when to seize an opportunity, the next most important thing in life is knowing when not to seize an opportunity. And he's right. Sometimes the best, uh, you know, the best thing to do is let an opportunity go by and not take it because Satan has his fish hook in it and you bite it and he'll hook it. So how do you know the difference between opportunities you take and opportunities you shouldn't take? Well, I've got five principles very quickly to share with you. Because we all get opportunities every day, yeah? yeah. To do something, to uh, have an opportunity. And so we've got, we got to have some way of figuring out what we take and what we don't take. Because not every opportunity is from God. And not every opportunity does God want us to take. So, let's give five quick principles. Number one, principle number one is does that opportunity square with the Word of God? God never, ever, ever leads contrary to the Word of God. Ever. You know, I've had people say to me, well, you know, I'm going to marry this uh, unbelieving man or woman, and I'm sure it's from God. No, it isn't. It can't be. Because the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked. I've had people say, well, my boyfriend and I are living together, my girlfriend and I are living together, and we're sexually active, but I'm sure God's God's pleased with that. No, he isn't. No, no. Don't kid yourself. God, you know, God, God led us to do this. No, he didn't. I don't know who led you, but it wasn't God. Because God never leads contrary to his word. God led me to embezzle money from my co company. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. You know, God led me to gossip about this woman or man. No, he didn't. God didn't lead you to do any of these things because God doesn't lead contrary to the Word of God. Never has, never will. So the first way to see if an opportunity is from God is to see if it squares with the Word of God. That's why in order to make good decisions, as we've said before, we got to be people of the book. Because if you don't know the book, how are you going to know if something squares with the Word of God or not? Say, Lon, I'm going to call you up. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're going to know the book. That's why you need to know the book. Okay? Second principle. Does it square with the Word of God? Number two, do you sa what happens when you saturate it in prayer? I'm not talking about sprinkling it. I'm talking about saturating it in prayer. You say, well, Lon, you don't always have an opportunity to saturate it. You don't always have a chance to saturate an opportunity in prayer. Sometimes you have to make a quick decision. Okay, sometimes. But not usually you got time to saturate something in prayer. Most opportunities don't have to be taken today. You know, Brenda and I, when we first got married, set up a, a rule that we still follow to this day. And that is sleep on every decision before we make it, especially when it comes to a purchase. You know how you go to the store and you see something you really like, whether it's a piece of furniture or a piece of jewelry or a piece of clothing or a pair of Jimmy Choo shoes. We don't buy Jimmy Choo shoes, but I do know that name. You know, I even know the name of the shoes that have like the red soles, Christian La Bouton. You're pressed, aren't you? Are you pressed? Yeah. I read it up, have a pair, but I know the name of the ones with the red soul. Okay, what are we talking about? So you go to the store, and, 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 and the guy, or the, the salesperson is just like right there, and I mean, you want these so bad, you're salivating. You know, having to wipe your mouth, you know, like this. 
<laughs> we always have, we've had a practice since we were first married. We go home and we sleep on it. And we hold each other accountable. We're not about, no, what's that? We go home and sleep on it. Lana, no, we go home and sleep on it. You know what? You go home and get out of that environment where you're being pressed and you're being impulsive and you sleep on it. And a lot of times the next day, you don't want to buy this thing. You're like, I can't believe I wanted to buy this thing. But you know, any of you guys ever seen Mr. Toad's Wild Ride? You know, you're all balls. <laughs> Opportunities are the same way. You know, things need to be saturated in prayer. You have an opportunity, lay it before the Lord and keep laying it before the Lord and soak it in prayer. And that's where wisdom comes from. And a lot of times, opportunities that look awesome and must be from God, it seems like, and they don't violate the Bible, then you saturate them in prayer. And all of a sudden, saturated in prayer. Principle number three is, what do your godly friends say? I don't have any godly friends. Well, then that's a problem. You need to get some godly friends. And that's the whole thing about godly friends, is that there is wisdom in a multitude of counselors, the book of Proverbs says. The book of Proverbs also says that every man's, every man's opinion is right in his own heart. So that's why we need friends, you know, who say to us, are you stupid? Are you crazy? I don't care what you think. That's a really bad thing to do. Girlfriends saying to other girlfriends, you serious about him? That's so stupid. Are you crazy? You know, guys saying to guys, hey, you know, are you crazy? You really thinking about buying that boat? Are you nuts? Or whatever. We need godly friends. Yes? Yes. And then we need to talk to them, and then we need to listen to them. You know, I look at American Idol. Any guys fans of American Idol? Great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you know how American Idol works. These people come on, you know, I particularly like the, 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 the beginning when they yeah. do all the, the, you know, before they get to the real people who can sing. Because the ones at the beginning are the ones that are hysterical. And, and they're serious as can be. And they come in and they go, I, this is what I've always wanted to do. And everybody tells me I can sing. And everybody tells me I'm great. And then they open their mouth and they're horrible. I mean, they're, they're horrible. You know, Randy can't stop from laughing. And I mean, you know, everybody, I mean, they're horrible. And I always turn to Brenda and say, don't these people have any friends? <laughs> Somebody who's honest enough and loves them enough to say to them, you stink. You can't sing. No, you can don't stop kidding yourself. You're awful. I look at women sometimes and how they dress. And I go, don't these don't these women have any friends who will say to them, that looks terrible on you? You know, or guys who in the same way. I mean, we need friends. We need people who will tell us the truth. Godly people with godly perspectives on life. Who will, who will who will tell us the truth and who will listen to and 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 I, I'm glad to say the Lord's given me a few of them you don't need 50 of them you know a half a dozen of them and uh, I have a couple of them on this trip but I remember a couple of years ago Courtney and I wanted to do a trip together and I wanted to do something you don't even know what it is it wasn't sinful I mean I didn't want to go it wasn't sinful it was just a decision and I went to Gordy and I said, Gordy, what do you think about this? And he said, oh, Lana, that's a really bad decision. Don't do that. I said, really, Gordy? I said, I really? And I really was tempted to do it. And Gordy just said, it's a bad, bad decision. Remember what I'm talking about? 
listening to him. It would have been a really bad decision. It's not committing adultery or stealing money or anything like that. It was just a decision about the trip I wanted us to do. And Gordy said this is a horrible decision. And he was right. We need friends like that who will say, I don't really care what you want to do. That's a really bad decision. Okay? So let's go back and review our principles. Number one, does it square with the Word of God? Number two, uh, uh, you, uh, what happens when you saturate it in prayer? Number three, what do your godly friends say? I didn't ask them. Well, you need to. <laughs> Principle number four is uh, 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 think through the consequences before we do something. You know, the book of Proverbs, one of my favorite verses, says this. A wise man sees trouble coming and gets out of the way. A fool keeps right on going and pays the price. You know, we, we got to ask, like, okay, if I do this, what could be some of the consequences that might result? Most of us don't slow down long enough to ask that kind of question. But that's a really important question to ask. If I do this, what could happen? Now, is it possible the Lord will be merciful and it won't happen? Yeah, but you can't presume that. No, no. You got to think worst case scenario and, and say, if worst came to worst and God didn't ameliorate the consequences at all of my doing this, what could happen? And you know, as a pastor, I have to think of that all the time. I mean, there, there are a lot of decisions that I have to say, okay, if I do this, what's this going to mean? Well, you know, if you do this, you could lose your ministry. You know, you could get fired. Hurt a lot of people's lives who are putting confidence in you and trusting you, and, and you, you know, and, and you could really influence their spiritual life in a really deleterious and negative way. You know, you, you could lose your family if you do something bad enough. I mean, you, you know, you got to think about stuff like this and say, Whoops, man, it ain't worth that. It ain't worth that. You know, there's not a woman in the world that's worth putting my ministry at risk after 40 years of being in the ministry. I don't care who it is. You know, if Marilyn Monroe was still living, she wouldn't be worth it. No, nobody's worth that. You know what I'm saying? But you got to think like that. So often we don't think, all right, what could happen if I do this? Then we do it. That's what David did with Bathsheba. You know, he had stopped long enough to think what could have happened if he'd have done this I guarantee you he would not have done what he did. Because look what happened. I mean, his whole it was, his whole family fell apart. It was a disaster. Folks, you got to stop the thing. Say, you know, play it through. Okay, if I do this, let's absolutely go to worst case scenario. If God let that happen, is this worth it? <laughs> There's not much worth it when we play that out. That's sinful. There's nothing sinful worth it. There's a lot of things not worth it. Finally, number five, let's review. The square with the Word of God. What happens when we saturate it in prayer? Number three, what do your godly friends say? Number four, what could be the potential consequences of doing this? And finally, number five, does it bust, does it break any of the godly boundaries I've set for my life? We, every one of us should be setting godly boundaries in our lives because every one of us is out of control. We don't look like it standing here. We look like a nice group of people. But the flesh is out of control in every single one of us. Or if you don't know that yet, then you're in worse trouble than I thought you were because my flesh is utterly out of control. The flesh, your flesh is utterly out of control. And the only thing that keeps it in control is the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Praise God for that. But the flesh is so dangerous, it needs boundaries. You know, whether they're boundaries in terms of what we watch on television or boundaries of what where we go on the computer or boundaries of what we spend or boundaries on what we eat or, or boundaries on what magazines we buy and read or boundaries on what we let come out of our mouth. I, mean, I, I don't know. We need boundaries. And especially in those areas where we're weak. We're all weak in different areas. We're in we're weak. We really need good boundaries and then we need to keep them. Now the question is, if those boundaries are there to keep our flesh under control, 
control and keep us from sinning, do you really think God would send you an opportunity that breaks those boundaries? No. Uh-uh. Not going to happen. He wouldn't do it. Why? Because He loves us. And He's not going to lead us into temptation. Is uh, that what Psalm 23 says? He's not going to lead us into sin. So if you put a boundary up to keep you from sin, I guarantee an opportunity that leads you to break it is not from God. It can't be. It's contrary to the nature of who God is. And yet a lot of us, A, don't have any boundaries that are deliberate and set. And B, when we have them, if something comes along we get excited about and we break them. No, 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 no. Not a God, not a God thing. So, let's summarize. Here we go. If something squares with the Word of God, if after you saturate it in prayer, you have liberty in your spirit to do it. And we're not, we're not talking about spitting on it in prayer. We're talking about saturating it. If after you've talked to godly friends and they say, you know what? Yeah, this makes sense. If after you've thought through the consequences and said, you know what? I don't see any huge disasters coming from this if I do it. And number five, after you've made sure it doesn't break any godly boundaries you've set in your life to keep you from sin, then there's a very good chance you have an opportunity from God <coughs> looking you in the face. But if it doesn't pass one of those five tests, it's not from God. So let's talk about David. The killing Saul, is that, did that square with the word of God? No. Thou shalt not murder, right? After saturating it in prayer, is this something David felt the liberty to do? No, it said his conscience bothered him to even cut Saul's hem of the, his hem off. No, his conscience was beating him up. He didn't have liberty to do this. When he talked to his godly friends, what did they tell him? Well, he didn't have any godly friends at that moment. He had a bunch of renegades that were all saying, kill him, kill him, kill him. Basically, David's situation was anything they said, do the opposite. It's kind of what, what I would have done. All right? Did, did this opportunity, what, would have, what were the negative consequences if he did it? David would never have been able to unify the kingdom of Israel under him if he'd have killed Saul. Never. The people would have rebelled. The northern tribes that were loyal to Saul would have rebelled. David could never have put the kingdom of Israel together the way he did had he killed Saul. And finally, fifth of all, did it bust any godly boundaries? He had a boundary. His boundary was, I will not lay my hand on God's anointing. I don't care what Saul does, I don't care how close he gets to killing me, I am not going to touch God's anointing. It's up to God to deal with him. Would it have broken that boundary? Of course. So, was this opportunity from God? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And David was wise not to have taken it. Okay? If we will just slow down long enough to use these little buoys, when that five of buoys line up, you probably got something from God. But man, if there's a buoy way out of whack somewhere, either you don't have the right situation or you don't have the right time. Sometimes it's the right opportunity, it's just not the right time yet. But either way, don't do it. Don't do it. Remember, Satan loves to send the counterfeit just before the real McCoy. Just to see if we're willing to let the counterfeit go by, as attractive as it looks, to wait for God's best. The problem is, once we bite the counterfeit and get hooked, so often we can't get unhooked in time to take God's opportunity. It comes and goes by because we're hooked on the on the counterfeit. Be careful. Be careful. Make sure all the buoys line up before you do it. And if you're not sure, let me just give you a general rule. If in doubt, what? Throw out. Well, I've never heard that one. That's good. If in doubt, throw out. But I, I, I was going to say, if in doubt, don't. <laughs> but the same idea. If in doubt, don't. If you're not sure whether you should do it, don't. I very seldom ever regretted something I didn't do. But I sure have regretted some stuff I did do. If in doubt, listen, just wait. And if it's from God, believe me, it'll stick around long enough for you to become sure. But be careful. Alright, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thanks for giving
giving us buoys for life and not leaving us without guidance for how we're to run our lives. Lord, decision making in our life is a key component to living a godly life. We need to know how to make decisions in such a way that we can discern your will and your opportunities from the ones that aren't. So thanks for giving us some principles today. Help us set boundaries in our lives and keep them. Lord, give us godly friends and then help us to listen to them. Help us to know the Word of God and, and submit things to you in prayer and lay it before you and compare it to the Word of God. And help us to think through the consequences of our actions before we do. Lord, help us to slow down and make decisions that are wise consider and we'll save ourselves so much heartache and pain if we will so Lord uh, speak to our hearts thank you for the example of King David who didn't do what everybody was right. we were yes so let's close our eyes one second and imagine what were the enemies he was facing around what were his hardships as we try to understand the special of this nature is here. really close your eyes one second and imagine what what can you imagine Endangering David here. Which wild animals? Let's see. Here. Very good. How do you know? And specifically leopards. Okay? It sounds like science fiction, but we still have leopards in the very nature reserve we are now touring. You believe me? We have leopards in Israel. Actually, one. <laughs> So we see on the way, and then it's dry and white color. This is constant, and the stream doesn't change because it's not something that's affected by the rain. Of course, it's rainwater, but it came into the ground like we can tell down, and they come out from the years later. I guess I see them too. You know, they literally bottom it and it's drank this water already.
less is more. So I have no comment except to read the scriptures. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus and said, Lord, the one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the glory of God, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two days. Then he said to the disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews tried to stone you there. Why would you want to go back? And Jesus said, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks in the day will not stumble, for he sees by the world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. And after he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he's asleep, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but the disciples thought that he meant literal sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. So come now, let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Come, let us also go with him, that we may die alongside him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, who was to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and ran to Jesus. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. And Martha and Mary replied, Come and see, Lord. And there Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how much he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he, who opened the eyes of the blind man, have kept this man from dying if he wanted to? Jesus once more deeply moved in his spirit, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Martha said, Lord, 
The sister of the dead man said, Lord, by this time there's a bad odor, for he's been in there four days. So they met, they took up, so then Jesus said, did I not tell you? that if you believed, you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have always heard me. And I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of these people standing here, that they may believe you sent me. And when he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped with... I guess so. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priest and the Pharisees called a meeting and said, What are we accomplishing here? This man is performing miracles right in front of everyone. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away our place in our nation. And one of, us, one of them, Caiaphas, said, who was the high priest that year, you know nothing at all. Do you not realize it is better that one man die for the people, that the whole nation may live? Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the desert. And when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up to Jerusalem for the feast before Passover, and they kept looking for Jesus as they stood in the temple area. What do you think, they said? Is he not coming? But the chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, 